like most doctors, I recall every one of them vividly, the serious ones. You never forget them. I mean, I've been out of practice for 22 years, but I clearly remember the serious mistakes I made. I didn't make a whole lot of them, but you remember them. Um, uh, one that um, uh, would be helpful to talk about, I think, was uh, I was a pediatric surgeon, so I operated on uh, children. And um, one of the serious mistakes I made was failing to operate uh, on a child who had um, bleeding from the intestinal tract. Um, and um, uh, I delayed surgery so long that uh, she ended up dying from this. And um, as far as I was concerned, it was entirely a judgmental error on my part. Um, the, uh, the teaching and my experience, uh, I, was, I was fairly experienced at that time, been out of residency for 10 years or more. The teaching and my experience was that um, bleeding from the stomach in children always stops. You don't need to operate on them. And in fact, there was a fair amount in the literature about how it was wrong to operate on these people uh, because you didn't need to. And um, so I believed that. And, uh, and uh, so we treated the child and gave transfusions and so forth. And finally it became apparent that it wasn't stopping. And uh, by that time, there had been enough damage that we weren't able to save her. Um, I, of course, was devastated by this, as was the family. And um, uh, we all cried together. I mean, no, no question about it. And um, I did, you know, I did explain it to him, and I apologized and so forth. But no apology is going to bring back your child. And uh, I just thought it was um, about the worst thing I'd ever done in my life. What do you learn from it? Well, I think it's a very simple lesson, and that is decisions that are really uh, critical to life and death or nearby, near that, uh, should never be made by one person. Uh, if we worked in meaningful teams, I wouldn't have been able to get away with that. I would have had people challenge. Nobody ever, nobody challenged my judgment. No, no resident or other per person around ever asked any questions about it because it was my decision and I was respected and so it wasn't challenged. It should have been challenged. It should have been challenged. It should have been discussed in a, in a uh, open manner. And um, if we'd have had uh, another pair of eyes looking at that child, she might be alive today. As a new nurse, about eight or ten months out of nursing school, I was working in the critical care unit. Working on 3 to 11, a uh, patient went into VTAC. And um, at the time, the crash cart was in use across the hall. And I rushed in with the defibrillator only and shocked a patient without using the gel pads. Now, fortunately, the patient came out of that horrible rhythm, which, I mean, a life-threatening rhythm, but he had these horrible burns on his chest because of what I had done in my haste uh, and not thinking to do the right thing. Um, that patient stayed with us for three or four days. I still remember his name. I still remember his face. And it really, it, he was very upset about the burns on his chest. He didn't care that he was in a horrible rhythm. Uh, he was very upset with me, personally. He was, he was awake and knew what was going on. Uh, and it, it, it really weighed on me for a long time. It still does. That was hard for me as a 23-year-old kid to, you know, you just want to say, well, golly, you know, you're alive. You know, get over it. You know, I, I, fortunately, I didn't say that to him. In code situations, staff get so flustered, and myself included, that you just start grabbing things and saying, I think Epi's good. I think giving the lidocaine's good. I think we need to start some fluids. But without really thinking through what the protocol is and thinking through what we learned with, in ACLS and how do we get the airway open first, how do we do this, how do we give things appropriately, because you really can hurt somebody in an emergency situation like that. Well, having been a cardiac anesthesiologist for 20 years, I can tell you of several personal mistakes. Uh, the one that really jumps to mind was four or five years ago in the operating room doing a quick, complicated surgical case, um, which I've done 10,000 times with a lot of interruptions, surprises, distractions, and the surgeon turns to me without any warning and says, I'm done. 
And I'm thinking I have this patient asleep. We've given paralyzing agents. I've got a lot of things to do to wake this, this patient up. And the rate limiting step is really giving the medicine to reverse the curare or the muscle relaxant. Then I go on my drug cassette, like I've done day after day, several thousand times before, to grab this yellow vial of glycopyrrolate and some neostigmine, and I grabbed the wrong vial. And so I ended up reparalyzing the patient, which, which I recognized ten or, you know, several minutes later. Um, and we did, you know, it's hard. You kind of lean over the ether screen to the surgeon. You say, well, we're going to be here for a while because I just made a mistake, which is not a fun conversation. But we sat in the operating room for an hour, waited for it to wear off. And what struck me is when I went back and looked at the drug cassette, I had four yellow vials in the same drawer among 20 different drugs. They looked almost identical. And I thought, I'm the chief of the department. I'm the chairman of the surgery. I'm expert. I've done this for 20 years. And yet, in a quick, complicated situation, I picked up the wrong one and gave it. So what do you do? Well, you go and tell the truth to the patient and their family. And I, you know, I talked to the patient's wife, who's, because this guy's going to come in seven or eight times to have this cancer debrided before it's fatal. And I said, this is why we're in there for two hours, not one. You can see I was using both these medications. They look very similar. At the end of the case, I accidentally picked up the wrong vial, gave another dose. There's no residual harm. Uh, which is important because they're going to come back several times, and the last thing they need is more concern or anxiety that something's going to go wrong or something did go wrong that they don't know about. And, and what was interesting was talking to this woman. I mean, I'm apologizing to her, and like 30 seconds later, she gets up and puts her arm around me and says, you know, it's okay, doctor, we're human. We make mistakes. And I'm thinking, she's kind of way ahead of me on this. But what was important to her was what are you going to do to fix it? And I said, well, the good news is I'm kind of the boss. And I said, when I leave here, I'm walking to the OR pharmacy. And we're going to very quickly relabel these drugs, put red sticky labels over the top of all the muscle relaxants. And we're going to put physically separate them into different drawers, System Safety 101, so it's very hard to make this mistake. I think the, the real cultural learning was walking down the hallway to the OR pharmacy running to five of my anesthesia partners and showing them the two vials and saying, look what I just did. And having four of the five of them look me in the face and say, oh, I've done that. In fact, one said I did that last week. And I'm thinking, that's a pretty bad answer. I'm the chief of the department. I have no idea this is going on. And not only are we continuing to put patients at risk, but we're letting our friends and colleagues all go step in the same potholes. So. Um, that was one of many memorable adventures, shall we say.